Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We've looked at a few ARM-based Windows laptops over the last couple of years, and they haven't been all that great from a compatibility standpoint, but things are improving. And today we're taking a look at a Lenovo entry. This is the ThinkPad X13S, and this is powered by a new Snapdragon 8CX processor, and it's running Windows 11. And we're going to take a closer look and see how ARM is running on Windows 11 in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from Lenovo. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new laptop is all about. Now, before we go too much further in this review, I think it's important to set expectations on this laptop. Who this is designed for are people that are running more basic kinds of Windows applications that need the best possible battery life in a thin and light form factor. You will not find better battery life on a 13-inch Windows laptop than you will on this one, but there will be some compromises to get there, which we'll talk about in this video. So if you're a gamer or somebody that runs some really intensive Intel-based applications, this laptop is not for you. But if you are someone who is hitting Excel and Word and doing some web browsing and some video watching, this is going to give you much better longevity versus an Intel or AMD based laptop with performance now that is getting very close to where some of those entry level Intel and AMD laptops end up. Now the price point on this starts at around $1,100 for the entry level model and then goes up from there. This one is probably about $2,200 as configured. I am seeing the $1,100 model pop on and pop off their website, so I think everyone's grabbing those up as they become available. So keep shopping, and I think you'll find one at the price point that you are looking for. Now, the one we're looking at today comes equipped with that Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3 processor. This is the same chip that you'll find on all price levels of this machine. This is the newest Snapdragon processor designed to run Windows, and they say it performs better than the old one. And we'll take a look at some benchmarks in a minute to see if that is the case. This one has 16 gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM on board. You cannot upgrade the RAM, so you should choose the RAM configuration that'll work best for you when you buy it. This one also has a one terabyte NVMe SSD inside. And that NVMe SSD is upgradable on this machine. I grabbed this still shot from their teardown video on the Lenovo support page. So you should be able to upgrade the storage over time, although I am not sure what the maximum storage will be on this one. But if you happen to choose a version with a lower level of storage later on, you can add more to it. Now, right now they've got three different display options on this one. They're all 13 inch displays running at 1920 by 1200 in a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. So the screen is a little taller than some laptops you might've bought a couple of years ago. This is running at 300 nits of brightness, although it looks pretty decent even under my studio lights here. This particular model is the touch version of their display, but the entry level model has just a regular one. Uh, this one will cover about 72% of the NTSC color space, which means it's not going to be all that great for creative endeavors, although they do have a version that's slightly brighter at 400 nits that'll cover 100% of sRGB. Now it is incredibly lightweight. It is only 2.3 pounds or 1.06 kilograms. This is lighter than the X1 Carbon is. It's made out of a mixture of magnesium and plastic. It feels more plasticky than metal, um, but Lenovo says this is built to the same rugged specifications as all of their other ThinkPads are. And it does feel pretty solid, but not as solid as some of the other ThinkPad laptops that we have looked at. The display goes back to about here, as you can see. So you're not gonna be able to flip the display around and use it like a tablet. So if you were deciding on whether or not to get the touch screen, you might do okay without it, given that you really can't put a pen to it or anything along those lines. It does though have your traditional ThinkPad keyboard here, although the key travel feels pretty shallow on this one versus some of the other ThinkPads which with much uh, deeper key travel on there. You do though have your tracking nub here, uh, which works very nicely along with the buttons here at the top of the trackpad. 
The trackpad, though, doesn't feel all that great to me. It feels very springy and plasticky. I don't want to say it feels cheap, but it's definitely not the nicest trackpad I have seen on a ThinkPad before. And that's my only knock against the keyboard and trackpad layout here. The keyboard is also backlit. There is a fingerprint reader integrated into the power switch, and you have a uh, face detector here inside of the webcam, so you can use both the fingerprint and the Windows facial recognition to get into the machine. Now, the webcam on this one is a 1080p webcam that will shoot at 30 frames per second. The image quality is pretty good out of it for a compact laptop. It, though, lacks the ability to block the camera lens with a shutter, which is something we typically see on a lot of these Lenovo ThinkPads. So if you are concerned for privacy, you might have to get the tape out to cover that lens up. There are speakers on the top of the keyboard deck here. They're very tinny on this one when it comes to music, but they're adequate for making conference calls and whatnot. But if you are intending to listen to music on this device, I would suggest getting some headphones for the best performance. As far as ports are concerned, on the left-hand side here, we have two USB Type-C ports. These are USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 ports, which means they are not USB 4 ports, but they will support 10 gigabit per second data transfers. You'll be able to charge the laptop through those ports. You can plug your charger into either one and both ports support video output. And a little bit earlier, I hooked up two 4K60 monitors to those USB-C ports. And as you can see, you can drive the laptop display and those two displays independently. I also hooked it up to my docking station that I have here on the desk. This is a USB Type-C docking station that is currently charging the laptop, giving us some ports and some ethernet. And as you can see, we've got three displays attached to that as well, and that all works through the single port. So if you intend to dock this at your desk, provided you're using a USB Type-C and not a Thunderbolt dock, I think you can make this work as a desktop. Now on the right-hand side of the unit here, we have a headphone microphone jack, and right here is a SIM card slot because they have versions of this that support 4G and 5G cellular connections. This one had a SIM card in for us to try out from AT&T, and the AT&T network where I am is your traditional sub-6 5G. It works fine, but I don't have any of the millimeter wave towers nearby that this supports. So if you're in a densely populated area where you've got that millimeter wave, you do have an option for some of the really fast 5G out of this, and that would give you kind of a seamless transition from Wi-Fi at home to having an always-on data connection anywhere there is a cellular connection, and that might be something that is attractive in this form factor. Uh, that does cost extra, though, and I believe the millimeter wave option is an add-on over the traditional sub-6 5G radio. This also has Wi-Fi 6E built in, too, and the Wi-Fi has been working great, as you'll see in a minute. And then right here is a Kensington lock slot, so nobody walks off with your thin and light laptop. All right, let's take a look now and see how this laptop performs, and we'll begin with the basics, some word processing in Microsoft Office. Now, the Office suite is largely optimized for the ARM architecture, so you'll get decent performance if you are living within the Microsoft 365 ecosystem here. And this app runs just about as well as it does, I think, on a mid-range Intel or AMD-based device. It's not going to be as snappy, perhaps, as a 12th generation i7 Intel processor, but I think for people that do basic work in Office, like Excel and Word and PowerPoint, this is going to feel just fine, and you're going to get the really awesome battery life that these ARM chips deliver. Now, I also loaded up, though, some more traditional Intel-based applications. This one is a 64-bit Intel app that is designed to run on a traditional Intel or AMD processor. Uh, this particular app is what I use in my amateur radio hobby to monitor weak radio signals from around the world. And what's nice about Windows 11 is that it supports both 64-bit and 32-bit Intel and AMD applications, so you don't need to install beta versions of Windows any longer. There's nothing additional to put on over the top. You just click on your app and install it like you used to, and then just load it up. And as long as the app is not doing something crazy, it's probably going to work, but of course, your mileage will vary. 
and I recommend if you buy one of these laptops, buy it from some place that will allow you to try it out first to make sure all of the applications you need to run are truly compatible. Some things will begin to load up and then crash out on you. So for example, DaVinci Resolve here, which is a 64-bit video editor, does not yet have an ARM-optimized version on Windows, at least at the time I'm recording this video. And the application actually loads up most of the way, but when DaVinci Resolve starts looking for what graphics system to work in for its video rendering, you will get an error here saying, I can't find a supported GPU, and you're stuck. And then you have to quit, and at the moment, you can't run DaVinci Resolve on this laptop. So this is the kind of compatibility issue that you'll run into. This is especially prevalent in games, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. But if your application does work, uh, it will actually work pretty nicely, I think, much better than what I've seen on prior ARM attempts from uh, Microsoft and Qualcomm. Now, there's also good compatibility here on 32-bit apps. I've run a bunch of them. This is a VNC client that I'm currently running that's connected to a computer in the other room, and that loaded up and ran just fine. So I think as long as it's kind of sticking to basic Windows types of operations, things that can be easily mapped within the emulation layer, all is good. But when things step outside of that is where you run into trouble. And I found that Apple's implementation of ARM on OS 10, 11 or 12, whatever version they're up to these days, does this better than Microsoft does. But Windows 11 feels like a major upgrade in compatibility over what we saw with Windows 10 in prior iterations. Now, a little earlier, I ran the Geekbench benchmark test, and the Snapdragon processor on this new machine is a bit faster than the Generation 2 processor we saw in the HP Elite Folio earlier this year. So you can see the single core score is 1,120, and the multi-core is 5,869. That is below the Apple M1. It's also below the new i7 chips, but the performance boost over the second generation chip, I think, is just enough to make this feel a little less like a low-end machine and more like a mid-range one. Let's take a look now at web browsing. Now, at the time I'm recording this video, there is still not an official version of Google Chrome for ARM-based Windows laptops. There is, though, a build of Chromium for ARM that you can find and install that, of course, is the open source version of Chrome that appears to run pretty nicely. So if you are looking to get away from Microsoft Edge, you do have some choices now. Uh, so you do have Chromium, and there is now a Firefox build also available on ARM that you can download and install. But all of these are currently in beta form, although both seem to be running at a pretty stable clip these days. So I think you'll have some browser choices now that you didn't have before. And as you can see here, the ARM64 version of Chromium here is running quite nicely. Things are rendering very quickly as I'm browsing around the web, and we've got the benefit of that Wi-Fi 6 radio on board as well. Now, we always like to test out the YouTube video playback performance on these laptops, and we uh, ran a couple of different scenarios here, but they all seem to be giving us the same results. So I am running a 1080p 60 video uh, on the Edge browser right now. And as you can see, we're dropping frames every once in a while. Not a lot that this would be noticeable, but it is dropping them. I tried to up the performance settings. I tried different browsers, including the Chromium browser, and we're just getting a couple of drop frames here or there. Nothing noticeable, but we're getting them. And I think that's important to point out, but otherwise the video playback performance on this is pretty good. And I think if you're watching Netflix or other uh, types of content that come in at lower frame rates, everything should be fine. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, I got a score of 101.8 using the Edge browser. And this was very close to the score that I got out of the ARM version of Chromium. And as you can see here, this is about the performance that we see out of a Ryzen 5 4500U-based machine, at least for web browsing and the things that web browsing requires. But as you'll also see at the top there, the 12th generation i7 chips are much, much quicker when it comes to doing web-based tasks. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, this machine is all about the battery life. And in my testing, it lives up largely to Lenovo's claims of this having multi-day battery life. But like everything in this world, your mileage is going to vary. Now, if you stick to the basics like I have over the last couple of days, and do word processing and web browsing and a little bit of video watching, I think you could probably stretch out 
beyond just a single workday with this laptop doing those tasks, provided you keep the display brightness down and make sure you've got it tuned for the best efficiency in the power settings. But if you got a lot of stuff running in the background, if you've got a lot of higher end applications that demand more of its processor, if you're located far away from the cell tower and using that cellular radio, all of those things will impact the battery life. However, I think this one is still going to do a little better than an equivalent Intel or AMD device because it is just more efficient running with that ARM processor. But I think you really have to keep an eye on background tasks to get there. But the bottom line for someone living within the Microsoft 365 ecosystem is that this thing does deliver on its battery life claims. And I think you'll be very pleased with that, especially if battery life is the most important thing to you. So let's move on now to gaming. I was surprised that when games ran, they actually ran better than expected. So for example, this is The Witcher 3 that I ran a little bit earlier. Uh, this was running at 720p at the lowest settings, and we were getting about 25 to 30 frames per second here or there with a couple of little lag slowdowns every now and then. But it was much more playable than I expected, and in prior iterations of this ARM-based Windows experience, we were not able to get this game to run at all. And here it is running at a relatively playable clip here. But overall, game compatibility still remains an issue on these ARM-based devices. That's because there are very few games written for the ARM architecture, first of all, and everything has to get emulated in some way in order to run. Now, I found that at the moment, at least, the Vulkan architecture doesn't seem to be supported, so any game requiring Vulkan that I tried to load up didn't load at all. Some games that have anti-cheating code built in often crash because that anti-cheat code doesn't know what to do with the ARM processor in here because it hasn't been coded to support it yet. Uh, but games like GTA 5 here uh, actually do run, and that was not something I was able to get working in prior versions of Windows with the prior Snapdragon processors. But it doesn't run all that great here. So we're running at about 20 frames per second at 720p at the lowest settings, and I certainly get better performance out of the uh, current and previous generation Intel processors, often at higher resolutions. But you can, I guess, play the game here, and it's kind of neat that this ARM chip is able to emulate the uh, Intel experience here in a somewhat playable form. Now, this next game kind of surprised me. This is Wreckfest, and this is a crash-up derby game where you're driving your car around, smacking into other cars, and there's a lot of damage that it has to keep track of and a lot of physics going on. And when there's not a lot of cars bunched up on the screen, I'm finding I can get about 30 to 35 frames per second running at 1080p at the lowest settings. I'm noticing it running slower now because I think we're starting to hit some thermal throttling with this machine, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it was a much better gameplay experience than I anticipated. I didn't even expect this game to load at all, let alone play, and it actually plays pretty nicely. And I suspect that the code in this game is easily mappable, if you will, uh, to the ARM processor using Microsoft's emulation code here. And this game just seems to do it better than some of the other ones that I tried. So it'll be a hit or miss thing on gaming. I don't think you should buy this laptop to play games, but it's possible the games that you like to play might actually run on it. Just know that this will eat into the battery a lot more than Microsoft Office might. Now, if you're a Game Pass subscriber like I am, oddly right now, the Xbox app, at the time I'm recording this video, does not run on the laptop, so you can't install any Game Pass games to see if they run. You can, though, do game streaming through the web browser like I'm doing now, and it seems to run fine, and I think that's probably going to be the most surefire way to get your Game Pass games to run properly on this machine. Now on the 3D Mark Wildlife Extreme Benchmark test, we got a score of 3,041, and that puts this machine pretty much in line with what I got out of my Surface Laptop Go 2 that has an 11th generation i5 Intel processor, but that Surface Laptop is much more compatible with the games you might want to run versus this machine. However, the battery life on this is far greater than that, and that's the trade-off here, right? And going back to that chart here, we'll take a look, though, at the Apple M1. Uh, that one still performs much, much better than 
the Snapdragon processors do, but we are seeing some progress. Now, I should note that that wildlife benchmark is optimized for each of the platforms that it ran on, and the version that ran on this laptop was the one for Windows ARM. So I think this is a pretty good apples to apples comparison of performance. Now, this is a fanless laptop. It makes no noise, which is great, but if it is placed under heavy sustained load, like a game might require, the only way for it to cool itself down is to slow itself down. And we also ran the 3 Mark wildlife stress test. And there we got a failing grade of 41.9%. 97% is passing on that test. And that indicates to me that if you're a power user, you're going to see a pretty wide variation in performance when you place this machine under load. And it's not designed for power users. It is designed for folks that run basic Windows applications and want the best possible battery life they can get out of them. So again, if you are a power user, this is not for you. Now, as far as Linux is concerned, there is not yet at the time I'm recording this video, a working bootable solution for Linux on the X13S. There's a lot of rapid development going on right now. I've been following a few threads on Reddit to see where things are at. It's possible that even by the time this video gets published, there might be a solution, but right this minute, there is not one. And if I do see one pop up before I have to send this back, I will uh, try to do a second video on it. But right now, no Linux that I can see beyond virtualization, but I think it will be coming at some point in the near future, and this might be a really killer ARM-based Linux device once the community figures out how to get all the hardware working on it. But so far, Windows only on this one, but a really nice development, I think, in getting a workable ARM solution running Windows that can run a lot of the applications that people might want to run day to day. And again, if you're living within the Office 365 ecosystem and want really, really good battery life, this will deliver that for you. And I think a pretty nice package here. So. Keep an eye on ARM development. I certainly will be as things move on here. And I think we're getting a lot closer than we were a few months ago. And it's been really encouraging to see Windows 11 handling both 32-bit and 64-bit emulated apps as well as it is. But it's still not yet perfect. And this will be a laptop that's going to work great for some people and not so great for others. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.